I want to talk in a while about how prescient this book is, how reading this book during the Ukraine war and during also the pressure on libraries um, in the United States to remove certain books from their shelves, that, that, these, that what you're writing about in the book from the 1920s, 1930s, actually has a, and the whole business of um, people going for, that the government's going for books first and then going for people, that, that the whole way that works. So I want to come back to that in a moment, but I want to start by asking about the technical problems surrounding the writing of this book. In other words, how do you write a book that um, is narrated effectively by an actual volume? It's not a person and um, it's not even an animal. It's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a silent object called a book. And of course, what you give the book is a sort of um, interior life arising from its content. But also you give it ears and eyes, you give it a mind and you give it a memory. It struck me that part of the reason why this works so well is that you have surrounded the consciousness of this book um, with a great deal of fact, with a great deal of information which is rooted in the real, so that the book merely becomes another member of the cast of the novel. And I, I wonder if you could start by um, telling us who Joseph Roth is, um, who is the author of the book, and who appears as a protagonist in the novel, as well as the book, just who, who, who he was, when he lived, what he did. Well, Joseph Roth was a, a Austrian Jewish author um, who um, became a celebrated uh, journalist in the, in the early 30s uh, and moved to Berlin from Vienna uh, and, and, and became a sort of a nomadic journalist uh, writer, writing sort of uh, interesting opinion pieces about Germany at the time, uh, and he sort of he saw what was coming in in the um, it, 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 you know in the sort of slow rise of Nazism at that time or the rapid rise of Nazism at the time. He eventually fled. Then, when Hitler came to power, he fled to Paris. Uh, he slowly became an alcoholic, or again rapidly became an alcoholic, um, and lived this. He basically lived out of a suitcase. And um, th this, um, he was he, he had this kind of vagrant, you know, his inability to live in the one place. I, I describe him as a, as a as a person who lived close to the arteries of departure. He always had picked a hotel that's close to the train station, as as if he couldn't get away fast enough. Uh, and um, f for me, that became hugely interesting because it described. This, this nomadic um, inability to settle uh, in, in, this, in this writer. Um, uh, he was, as I said, Jewish, but he, des he described himself as also um, a man without borders. Um, and I think that sort of applies to so many people th in these days. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, so many people in, in Ukraine at the moment as well. Mm -hmm. And the book itself um, that is narrating the story to tell the story that's quite politically charged in the Germany of the 1920s and 1930s. I know that Thomas Mann, for example, he really was fired up with German nationalism, with Prussian nationalism in 1914 mm -hmm. when the war broke out, First World War broke out. But his mind was changed some, um, somewhat by the appearance of people who had been maimed or injured on the streets of Munich in the aftermath of the war so that all the heroism was suddenly reduced to people des people maimed and injured, desperately looking for somewhere, to, something to do and somewhere to go. And it brought the human element into the big picture and it really frightened him and it really changed his mind. So, so, so I wonder if Joseph Roth writing a book about someone who has been injured in the war actually you know, was not necessarily designed to annoy people, but did actually make people feel, instead of writing about heroism, instead of writing about you know, um, the, the, the sort of suffering in the trenches, you end up writing about someone who has been injured. Yes, I mean, you, you have that absolutely right about Thomas Mann as, as well, in that before the First World War, you know, nationalism and the heroics of a soldier going to war and, and the sacrifice, the whole business of sacrifice and, and was a noble event in, in somebody's life. Uh, 
And that completely changed after the First World War because um, there were so many people with missing limbs on the streets of Munich, Berlin, everywhere. And it, it almost like it, it came to a point where there was a dignity about having a missing limb. And uh, Joseph Roth gets that very much with this, this in the character of, of the barrel organ player who, um, who has a, who's got a medal for fighting in the war, for, for, for giving away his leg, as, he's, as he describes it in the novel, you know. Yeah. He, gave yeah. the, he gave his leg to the state, you know. And, um, and so he, he gets this wonderful job as a barrel organ player. I mean, they, they, were, they were saying that there were, you know, 12,000 uh, buskers in Berlin at, at that uh, time, in, in the early 20s, you know. Uh, and they were all sort of war veterans and, and they had a great status, you know. Um, but it, it really gives a, a picture of, the, of this uh, devastated, uh, 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 devastation of the war, you know. I mean, Joseph Roth describes um, people who just twitched, you know. I mean, missing one leg is, is, is one, uh, it was a terrible thing in a way, but there were people who just sat in rooms this is also applies to England. I mean, it was, it's now called post-traumatic stress, but they just sat in rooms, unable to speak, and they just twitched all day. And um, they obviously, it was called shell shock then later on. But um, so we, we kind of feel the damage that war does in, through these novels. <clears throat> I wonder if you're writing out of a certain tradition, which would include something like um, Gunter Grass of the Tin Drum and a novel called A Good Soldier's Vike. And that if, if both you and Joseph Roth, I mean, in the, in the figure of Andreas Pum and in your figure of the book, you're talking about you're talking about these sort of slightly comic figures at the edge of the crowd whose attitude towards the world is less than, let's say, um, officious or respectful, who, who take a view that they would like to be left alone by everybody. And if everyone could just do that, then the world would be a good place. But in the meantime, they have to spend, work out strategies of evasion, how to get out of trouble and how to, how to enjoy their lives despite all the efforts of officialdom, people who run wars, governments to annoy them, disturb them and upset them. And out of that, you get a sort of comic energy. Are, are, are you conscious of that tradition? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean the tin drum and soldier swike, uh, good soldier swike. You know, they're very sort of formative books in in my sort of reading schedule as a as a young man. Um, and 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 you you put it very well, Colm. There is this kind of a comic distance from the real world, uh, and. I think that sort of was a lucky thing when I just began to sort of uh, think of this novel in the in the voice of the of the book itself. It, se it seemed to kind of dispose of me as an author, and I could step back into this. Um, uh, it was either a child a childish version of of myself or an old man's version of myself. You know, the, 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 in that sort of you know, I, it didn't have to be my views of the world. It could be this kind of book thinking in this kind of very vulnerable book thinking about the world and having opinions that sort of that, you know, cross a, a sort of an entire century. Uh, <clears throat> I felt also, I mean, this is a contemporary novel. In other words, the story begins with a woman called Lena Connect and that she is alive now and that she is in possession of the book by some strange set of circumstances. And the book crosses the Atlantic, has already crossed the Atlantic to America and now comes back to Europe with her. But I, I think it's important that it, it, it isn't Europe as much as the city of Berlin. And you've been writing about the city of Berlin now for more than 30 years. And it, even more than when you wrote about it first in your novel, Surrogate City, which I think was published in 1990. But even more than then, much more than then, the city has become there's a moment in the book where you talk about, a, is it a street with 12 languages? The whole idea of, of, a, of a sort of crossroads of Europe where every language is spoken, where everyone is on the way somewhere else, except Berlin becomes a sort of refuge. And that, and that that energy from Berlin is there in the book, but also, of course, Berlin's history is in the book. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, this, it, that street, Zonenallee, 
in in the in the Neukölln in in Berlin is is quite extraordinary. It's it's like the Arab district, you know. You have these Lebanese, Turkish people, people from Egypt, from all the kind of uh, Arab countries living on the same street, and they very often have sort of rows between them and sort of uh, street fights and things like that. And but it's a it's a fantastic mixture uh, that sort of represents the way uh, Berlin is now. But it also fascinates me that it sort of it, it almost mirrors the the Berlin of the 1920s as well, with all the refugees coming from from uh, from the east. Um, you know, the, the, the in the 1920s they used to call it the menace from the east. All these migrants coming in. That's how Joseph wrote wrote it in one of his pieces. Yeah. Why are we calling it the menace from the east? And it's almost like that's what it's being called now. I mean, I think there's a much better attitude now in Europe, hopefully, uh, towards migrants now. Um, but that mixture gives, and I think that's the whole thing about migrancy in general, and we are experiencing that very much in Ireland now, that it gives a country huge energy. All these people coming in. Migrants tend to be much more industrious, much more inventive. Their children become become very sort of eager to achieve things um it migrancy gives um it gives a country a huge um, energy and it's fantastic to see ireland taking in what seventeen thousand ukrainian refugees at the moment whereas whereas britain is only taking three thousand in that's a terrible jibe to put in now but uh it is it is it is where sort of the the future lies in in sort of the accepting migrants yeah, and I mean, it causes you to dream um, of those 17,000, surely one of them or more than one of them brought a book with them. Surely there's in some house in Dublin or in Meath, there's a book that's been carried across Europe, a special book that's never going to leave Ireland or might never leave Ireland for the moment. It's going to have its own history, its own story to tell. And what, what we're talking about here is the idea of a book as a living object that, I mean, forget for a moment this your book having a mind and a memory and a way of seeing and hearing. But uh, there's a wonderful, um, at, at the end of chapter two of your book, there's a wonderful moment where Lena, before she leaves New York, she goes into MoMA, she goes into the Museum of Modern Art, and she just wants to say farewell to a painting by Rothko. And she looks at the Rothko painting. Um, the Rothko painting must have soaked up a million hearts by now, just as I, just as I, meaning the book who's narrating the story, just as I have accumulated the inner lives of my readers, their thoughts have been added in layers underneath the text, turning me into a living thing with human faculties. I have the ability to remember. I can tell when history is in danger of repeating itself. So you have the book, the physical book, as a sort of Cassandra figure. And the Cassandra figure arises not by because, you, because you've imagined it, but because the whole idea of reading a book is that no matter what way you go, it's a two-way process. And that the book is reading you, but also you're so involved with those words, those printed words, that the book takes on a life, takes on a sort of fantastical you know, in, inner life, which you decide then to move into it being a sort of outer life. But what you're talking about, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is some idea that your narrator represents the mind, the spirit at its most exalted, at its most serious, and at, at its most necessary. That you're, that you're talking about some idea of culture that's not that, that's not a luxury, but is somehow an essential element in understanding our place in the world. And, and that this book, therefore, it isn't hard to move from it being a dead object on, on, on a table to being a living object with a mind, a memory, and a way of seeing and and seeing and hearing. So that. And um, just did, did this book come from your thinking, for example, about the burning of the books in, in Germany in 1933, the whole idea of the book as a, as a dangerous thing, as well as being, of course, a liberating thing? Yes, I mean, that's, that's a lovely way of putting it, uh, Colin, that, you know, a book is a physical object, and it's, a, as you say, a dead object, but it is, it is essentially a mind. You know, it is a living thing because it sort of it it carries our stories, it carries it, it carries our memory. It sort of it becomes a version of ourselves. When we when we open a book, we read it, 
not as sort of an ex, a completely external thing, but we put ourselves into it. So we put sort of this, uh, as you described from from the, it, it, as happens like when you watch, a, when you look at a, Roth, a Rothko painting, you know, you, you enter into that painting and it's the same way that you enter into a book as well as, as a, so that came to me early on in, as in the writing of the thing, how, um, how much life there is in a book and uh, how, um, yes, how, how, how it carries our, our story, you know. Um, yeah, and, and in Berlin, I remember I was talking about it being a sort of dynamic city, a crossroads, a sort of melting pot, um, a place where people go um, to survive from elsewhere. There's also the sense of Berlin as a place filled with memory that you can't really walk through the center without knowing this is where the East was, this is where the West was, this is where the Chancellery was, this is where certain other things occurred, this is where there was a synagogue once, that, that you have all that palimpsest, so all that a sort, of, a sort of hidden shadowy map of an old Berlin. And could you just describe for us how, how if you were to ask an architect, can you make me a, st a statue or some way of remembering the place where the books were burned, where the books were taken out of libraries and put onto a fire by these fanatical students who were overseen by the government. How would you make such a monument and tell, tell us what the monument looks like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, Berlin is an extraordinary place like that, uh, in that sort of, uh, I, I often feel when I'm walking the streets that the, the, the memory is coming, actually coming up through the streets. And it's in one place where you, mentioned there is is this the opera square which is come very close to the library the state library in berlin where the students uh, had this initiative to take the books out of out of the library the the toxic books as they were as they, as they were called out of the library and they brought them out in bundles and they passed them along um person by person um along towards where the fire had been set up. It was a very sort of orchestrated event uh, in, the 19, in 1933. And um, it's, um, they, they had sort of already put out sand on, a, on the cobbles to, 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 uh, to save the, the, sand, the cobbles from being burned. And there they sort of set up this funeral, uh, this, this kind of pyre of uh, which they would set a light. And, uh, and nowadays, when you stand there in the same place, they have this wonderful monument where you, where you, where there's a glass floor, and you look down into this basement where there are white shelves with bookshelves, but the bookshelves are empty. Uh, I think this is a, a wonderfully uh, creative way of demonstrating, you know, the loss of books and the and the damage that was done, the emptiness of the culture without books. Uh, uh, and people stand there, tourists, you know, stand there knowing that sort of so many years back, people stood there watching these books being burned. Uh, and underneath the, there's a little plaque alongside the, the, this monument where the words of Heinrich Heine, the great poet the, from the er, earlier uh, poet in Germany, um, he had this wonderful sentence where they, in a country where they burn books, they will eventually burn humans. Uh, and that was such a prescient thing to say in those days, it, um, which sadly became the truth then uh, when the Nazis took, took over. So I think you mentioned it before, Colin, like that they start with burning the books. They start with, with, with killing the truth. You know these 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 very vital cultural objects are taken out of society, out of out of reach of people, and that becomes sort of in a way of eliminating people in the end. Yes, yes. I mean, in in chapter thirty eight, you have him saying, um, "The <clears throat> past is no longer safe." I wanted to say to her, "My my time is coming back." Listen to what my author wrote to his friend Stefan Zweig a hundred years ago. The barbarians have taken over, so that um, I mean, I mean, it is extraordinary now. Um, Berlin again must be a place 
where a lot of people have come from Ukraine. It's, I think it's where I would go if I were, if I were getting out. You know, that is a city where you could melt into it and, and, that, and that it must be, again, a city w- with, with, within sight of war or certainly within, within, within hearing distance of it. Yes, I mean, it, it must be terrifying, you know, uh, it, to see the train stations in Berlin train station, the Hauptbahnhof is full of refugees from Ukraine now at the moment. And there are, pla- there are people standing with placards, you know, saying, I have a home for two people. I have a home for one person. You know, I have a home for a family. Uh, it's an extraordinary welcome they're getting. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not quite as amazing as the welcome they're getting in Poland and in Moldova, which they're in where they're taking absolutely millions in be, be, beyond their capacity to, to take up, you know. Um, <clears throat> but Berlin is sort of, is the place where they've seen all this happening so many times before. We've seen this happening with the Syrian refugees, you know, uh, a couple of years back. And um, you're, I think you're right. Berlin would be the place, the absolute yeah. best place uh, to go because it is such uh, such a mixture of of, yeah. of, uh, of yeah. cultures now. Um, I think it's possible that, I mean, th- this is in some ways a, a very sad book because they, we see the demise of um, Joseph Ross, we see the madness of his wife, um, we see the, the emergence of fascism, but oddly enough, this is a comic novel. And it's a comic novel because our hero, the, the novel, the actual book describing things, is a, is a bit of a chanter. You know, in other words, at one point he needs to hide. So they hide him, they, they get this novel, famous German novel by Fontaine called Effie Brest, and they just cut open the middle and they stick him into it. He sort of hides in there. His, his attitude towards the world is one of being a sort of chancer trickster figure. You know, that, 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 that he, um, he's slippery. And there's, there are lovely moments where um, he, for example, um, he begins to meet some of his friends who are obviously other books. And, uh, it's, and he talks about being left finally after being on his own with people he suddenly gets in with other books and i think it's where the whole comedy of his of his position emerges i mean rather than this being a sad novel about the rise of fascism that it becomes a really funny novel about the rise of a trickster where he's now back with his friends and he says um it's the greatest welcome you can imagine like the sound of a thousand monks or nuns in a monastery awaiting the return of one of their own they call out my title rebellion My author's name, Joseph Roth. They have a place ready for me to fit back in among them. Their voices emerge from deep inside a prolonged silence, full of gasping and whispering, as if the outside world from which they were once forged has come back to revisit them home again. The familiar scent of other books, the static air, the tranquility, this gathering. And it's lovely the way he moves from just being light, just being funny, just being entertaining. And then you put in a sentence that really turns the thing from that comedy into a sort of seriousness where there's just simple the sentence that um, you say home again the familiar scent of other books the static air the tranquility and then you go this gathering of human insight and the readers go to say yeah actually this is this is what this is the sanctuary filled with an infinite volume of thoughts and segments of imagination and then you go on to go back to the company they break out in a moment of unrestrained joy the arguments among them are put aside. They go back to being themselves again, giddy as children, cut off from the real world for so long, want to dance around the library in celebration. They can't wait to hear the news. Things have changed beyond recognition, I tell them. This is because this is now. People do most of their reading on phones now in, in smaller installments. Life is too short and books are too long, but they continue to be as relevant as always, I assure them, on the cusp of being rediscovered like an ancient archaeological find. The world is full of confusion and people need stories more than ever before. So I I just wanted to talk about this idea that you, I I think this happens also in say Surrogate City, where even though you're writing about a a certain sort of Berlin, I mean, where there are problems with the Turkish population and um, our our hero is a sort of an outsider protagonist sort of watching this. Nonetheless, there is a sort of lightness at the heart of it. But this book is actually, sometimes you turn a page and you just think, this is ingenious. This guy, meaning the novelist, meaning the novel, meaning the book, is such a, he's such a, he, he's a sort of pickpocket figure in, on, the, on, the, on the edge of the crowd in a, in a, in a European novel. He's like, um, he, he's not exactly Don Quixote, but he is a bit Sancho. He has a bit of Sancho in him. 
And um, I do love him. I mean, you do get to feel, God, I hope he's going to be okay. Now, how you make that happen, how you make an inanimate object and you want me to feel he's going to be okay, I don't know. But I just wonder if you give us any clue as to how this gets made. Well, that's uh, lovely to hear that, Colin. Um, yes, I mean, the book is always in danger. But, you know, there are moments where it, it, it feels completely safe when it's back in that library in Magdeburg. Uh, among his friends, and um, he feels the welcome. He feels a welcome fr among the, all the other books that he doesn't quite get in the in the human world. Uh, but uh, he, he, the book, he. I keep saying he, and we, we keep saying he as as yes. the book. He, I, mean, I, th I thought I thought the book was kind of gender free in in a lot of ways too. You know. Um, oh, I thought it's Hugo. I'm terribly sorry. I really see him as a bloke. Oh, is he? All right. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't really, let's discuss this later, but I do see him as one of those guys who, you know, um, was from moment onward was loved by his grandmother. No matter what he did, he got away with so that he still feels no matter what happens, he's the one who's going to survive. And um, I just see him also as there's an enti he's entitled. He feels entitled to go anywhere and be anything. I see this as completely male, but but yes. oh, no, yeah, I, think, I think you're right. It is it is a projection of of the author, I suppose. Uh, but they have they have this wonderful word in German, Überlebenskünstler, uh, which is a, a survival artist. I mean, lots of people like Kafka and and other authors have mentioned the word uh, Überlebenskünstler, and that's in effect who, what this book is. He sort of he basically is surviving from day to day. And um, he goes through dangerous moments. He's, you know, obviously almost burnt at one stage in his, his life as such, and then rescued, then stolen, then, then, um, then ends up back where he was talking to his friends. And, um, and yes, he's, he's, he survives over 100 years to witness, you know, not only 100 years back, but witness a century in passing. Um, and then, of course, in the library where he's returned to, where they welcome him back like a, a, a crowd of monks. Overnight, then, he gets into sort of this major discussion about love. And all the different books sort of throw a pitch in their sort of their version of, of what love means. Like we, we have Seamus Heaney there saying it's, you know, love is just two people getting the measure of each other which I thought, always thought was a wonderful phrase. And then you have Ted Hughes saying, you know, uh, you know, people fall apart after love, like two halves of a lopped melon. And so that kicks off this, you know, great argument. And there's there's even sort of Knausgaard that the celebrated Norwegian yeah, author. Um, John Millington Singh makes an appearance. And, and because you don't name the books, you know, the reader has a lovely time guessing. Um, I saw Richard Ford's Canada there. Exactly, yes. I saw That's Joan Gideon's um, um, Dear Magical Thinking. And th yes. they're all there having a discussion with him about mm. love. Exactly, yeah. I mean, there, you know, there are tragic versions. versions they're, they're, they're um, uh, you know, warm-hearted versions. You know, all the books, all books have different ideas about, about love. And uh, it was, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a whole lot. I mean, everybody reading the book would probably add an extra sort of 20 or 30 versions of love them to, for, them, of, for themselves. Uh, but I mean, I, I think it's great here that, you know, you could easily make this war in that they all end up discussing war or discussing freedom or discussing censorship. And it could be like a meeting of Penn International, you know, <clears throat> and, but by making it love, you go back to the roots to the human element, to the thing that books are best about, or that novels are best about in poems, which is the, the, the strangeness of human feeling, the mystery of, of, of um, you know, the, the central emotions. And I think it's great the way you don't, over, that you don't go in for a heavy hand of politicization uh, of the book mm -hmm. once you have them at peace. Well, that's, that's interesting you say that, yeah. I mean, it, it, it really, speaks for the kind of great human frontier is actually in this in this kind of interaction between people in in how we love each other these wonderful moments we 
create together as, as human beings. Uh, they say, they often say a lot more about the world than, than you could in any kind of political discussion, you know. I mean, there are many authors uh, who, who see every human interaction as a political statement. I mean, uh, authors like Brecht would, 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 um, would have said that, um, that you can't get away from sort of stating your identity, your, your position in the world, your way of seeing uh, your, your political view of the world, your entire viewpoint is, is stated in, in how you deal with other people and how you cross this wonderful divide between one human and another, we have to actually imagine the other person. When we love somebody, it's not something we do ourselves. It's, it's actually, we enter into this kind of projection. We imagine what the other person wants. And this leads me then to talk about imagining other people, where if you're, if you're writing this novel, just, just say, just take this novel, and your job is to imagine, yes, you've got to imagine the mind of this, of this strange creature, the book. You've got to imagine Lena, who's the protagonist, who's carrying the book. You've got to imagine Joseph Roth and his wife, who, who, Joseph Roth, who wrote the book and his, his own sort of circumstances. And you've got to imagine the political background. But what you seem to me to be imagining more than those characters is the reader. That in other words, there's a dynamic process whereby since you have the factual business of Joseph Roth, how he lived and what happened to his wife, the, the business of Lena, which is imagined, which is a normal process in a novel where she's traveling, she's, she's, the, she's the new woman in the city and all the things are going to happen to her. And then you have the actual um, protagonist, the book talking. If you don't think of the reader all the time, you, 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 you create confusion where the reader, oh my God, which of them is it here? And there's a funny seamlessness in this book where you can move from one of those scenes to the other, one of those characters to another without losing me for a second. And um, so I just, I'm asking you in, in that business of imagining others, we're talking about in the, in the process of love, being in love. And um, is, the, is it also that being an author, that, that idea of imagining, not an imaginary reader, but quite a concrete one who needs, how much information do I need to give here? Am I giving too much? Is it absolutely clear this is Joseph Roth and not the book? And um, so that as you're writing um, and as you're reading over, how conscious are you of that, of, 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 the, of the other, of the, well, of the reader? Um, yes, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm always conscious that the, 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 the narrator uh, or the protagonist in a book represents the reader it's it's it is in fact the reader stepping in and being allowed to look at things allowed to be in rooms and and seeing people i mean it's you know in some ways that's it's a very conventional novel in that way but the it, but instead of the author the omniscient author representing us in, in uh, or in a, in, a, in the form of a, a protagonist I have this kind of slightly distanced dead dead object doing it, and it becomes a witness. You know, in 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 certain areas in the book, like the the book is just listening to people talking. It's just a, a reporter hearing what's being said, um, and I think that was sort of I felt the book was successful in sort of in accessing these human stories just by being present um uh and i I, th I think yes the reader i, th I thought it was a way that i could have the reader enter into rooms and be there mm -hmm. uh, themselves yeah and um, one of the problems you have writing a novel is that you really should just get on with the story and you should think well where do i need to be by the end of this page and where do i need to be by the end of the next page and then you go back and you look at the the beginning of the process of novel writing or something like Don Quixote, and you look at the amount of, of deviation. <laughs> the whole novel is about they really didn't get anywhere at all, but they did a lot of thinking and fighting and dreaming on the way. And the novel becomes that sort of um, tension between where you where you just get on with it, tell it. You're, you're telling a story. You need to tell the story. Stop stopping. 
And then the author is feeling, no, 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 please forgive me, but I need to tell you something funny, just now, nah, just this little detail. And so the novel becomes a sort of battle going on in the, in the writer's imagination between what needs to be done and actually just a tiny little piece of luxury that you want to have. Um, just, uh, so that, uh, just, just to take two examples early on in the book where you're coming to the idea um, of, um, um, well, just the first one. Oh, I, I actually, actually, they're both on page five. Um, that she, he's talking about Lena. I mean, the book is telling us about Lena. Mostly, it's her phone she picks out. How can a book compete? And this is you. You see, I can see what you're doing. It's just you're ruminating. You're just having fun. You're circling the thing. You're Donkey Quixote who wants to go backwards or has just seen a bird and thinks it's a, it's a ship. You know, and, um, and mostly it's her phone she picks out. So then, okay, ruminate on phone, watch it. How can a book compete with such an intelligent piece of equipment? It contains her whole life, all her private details, her photographs, her passwords, her intimate messages. So this is defamiliarizing the, the phone. It knows her mind and it shapes her decisions. It does everything a book used to do. It behaves, and then he has another thought. As lovely, it, be, it, it behaves like an unfinished novel. This is her phone, constantly in, in, constantly in progress, guessing her worst fears and her wildest dreams. And the second one, just in the, in the next paragraph, um, is she's talking about her father and the whole idea of, of, of him as a baker. And his eyebrows were often covered in flour. So this is a memory. So just, and then you want, you, once more, you watch yourself circling. He came home from work with white eyelashes, great. And white flowery hands that gave him the appearance of a ghost. And the word ghost comes up quite a lot in this book, alive and moving, his inner being. So you're moving from the object, the flower. So if you were teaching creative writing, you couldn't do better than this. Look, he comes home with flowers. She remembers that. What are you going to do about the flower? Just remember he comes. So it could just end. His eyebrows were often covered in flower. That's a good memory. Something, something she, she's holding from the past. But you're getting the word flower and you're seeing where it will take you. He came home from work with white eyelashes. I mean, that's a further detail. So it's not just flower as a concept, as a memory. It's the strange detail of it getting into his eyelashes. And then you go on. White flowery hands that gave him the appearance of a ghost. Oh my God, you've moved actually into a sort of concept, away from object to concept, a ghost, alive and moving. And then you're moving into one more thing, which is the way in which he himself is ghostly, not just because he's covered in flower, but, but, but because he is actually in exile and that maybe his spirit has been left elsewhere. So you go on to say his inner being left behind in a country that no longer existed. And so in, from, one, from one tiny thing, you get, uh, you get in four sentences um, a great deal as you, do with the uh, as you do with the telephone. So, I mean, um, I just wonder if you could talk to us about that whole idea of writing where you suddenly need to circle back, where you need to enjoy yourself, where the whole purpose of a novel is not merely to tell a story like an arrow shooting, bang, bang, bang. Oh, that's, that's not an arrow, that's a gun. But I mean that, that idea of get on with it. And then the idea of no, the whole pleasure is in the telling or the going back or the adding details. And that when you're working, you've got to be sure to, hey, don't try this a third time on the same page, which you don't do, by the way. Uh, but also get on with the story. But also, if one more thing occurs to you, work out with tact whether the reader wants it or not. But you can't just have story. You must have this strange circling, this curling of the story back into itself. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating. That, that, that detail of the flower, I think that's is actually something that that Gunter Grass would have done this linking something in a almost symbolic way and it's sort of the flower becomes something larger in his life he's actually uh, this ghostly figure uh, but it's interesting how you speak about sort of the diversions like in literature you know and you've written a book great book about Thomas Mann he, he was the master of diversion I mean, he, he <laughs> couldn't stop. Nothing, nothing could be straight with Thomas yeah. Mann. It had to have the entire, you know, landscape of Germany and, and the kind of a collective family history had, had to be there as well. Um, and I do that sort of much, much shorter. I could, I could never get away with that sort of expansive writing. But there is sort of this great pleasure for an author of just... holding up the kind of, holding the plate up and in, as it's spinning for, for a moment and see, see where it finally drops. Um, um, and, and the, 
the opportunity that gave me like that, where all the Elena Connects objects were in, in this sack, you know, and he's right beside the mobile phone and he feels terribly insulted, actually. You know, like th that she might like this thing more than more than him, you know, uh, and it's actually much cl more clever machine. It can it's a thousand novels in this in this little little machine, and uh, so he wants to almost sort of say, ah, yeah, but it's it's still only a novel in progress, you know, you know, okay. whereas he is the finished business, you know. So okay. like jealousy, it's, it's a very human instinct that, yeah. that sort of enters into the story. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And uh, it was, it was an absolute delight to talk to you, Hugo. And um, as I say, it was such a pleasure going back to this book um, for another reading. And uh, it's an absolutely marvellous novel. <laughs>